The following episode contains content discussing fertility choices and infertility. We acknowledge that this content may be difficult and some may be triggered by the information discussed. We encourage you to use your discernment and continue to care for yourself and your well being. If you have any questions or concerns about fertility, please consult with your healthcare provider. We would like to acknowledge that not all fertility or reproductive situations are represented by this discussion. These situations can be as diverse as the population, but deserve just as much love and support as the ones discussed today. We hope you reach out with any questions. We would also like to acknowledge that the current changes in laws in regards to having autonomy over our own bodies as women is causing distress for many people and not just women. We feel that these issues and concerns around our body, our choice deserve its own spotlight and will be given space in a future episode. Welcome to Love Always Self, a podcast about connection to self, reflections of self, and how this impacts our reality. We're all about trying to find balance, discovering tools for spiritual wellness, and creating a safe place to have loving conversations about a broad range of topics. I'm Karista, a spiritualist with a background in nursing, health coaching, and personal training. I believe in a holistic mindset where everyone and everything can work together in harmony by giving love and attention to the body, mind, and spirit so that we can create a more balanced life. I wanna help guide you in your personal journey to create a life filled with joy, magic, and love. And I'm Shira, an explorer of personal truth with a background in program management, finance, and more recently, a spiritual intuitive, learning to connect with spiritual guides whom I like to call Mount Glass. I have an always growing passion to not only guide myself, but to also guide others in opening to and creating stronger connections with our highest self, allowing us to see and feel life in a whole new loving light. We believe that we are all connected and by learning to love self, we will elevate the collective consciousness and learn to create deeper connections with each other, self and source. As we grow and learn through our own life adventures and self discoveries, we hope you gain insights into your own truth. Don't forget to subscribe to stay notified of new content. We would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions or topics you'd like for us to discuss, please email us at contact at lovealwaysself.com or you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at lovealwaysself and this will be linked in the show notes. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So today we have a special guest joining us um, and welcome to Love Always Self. Before we get started, we just wanted to kind of throw out there that you might get a little triggered from our episode today. And we say that with compassion and love, and we want you to know that everything we're going to discuss today is for everyone's highest and greatest good always. And so um, to continue from that point, Harry, would you like to introduce our host, our new guest? So, (laughs) So we are super excited to have our first guest on today, one of our dearest friends friends. Tara is here to join us. Tara Bear. Hi. (laughs) So happy to have you on. Now, Tara is also known as Dr. Tara Cassidy. She has a PhD in clinical psychology and has completed her bachelor's, master's, and PhD at Western Michigan University. She has completed specialized training in trauma psychology, suicide prevention, and insomnia treatment. Tara's pronouns are she, her, and she has happily been married to a service member in the United States Armed Forces for two adventure-filled years. This has afforded her a variety of life experiences from working with the military to living in remote places like Alaska. Tara's main interests lie in sharing evidence-based treatments and practices to historically marginalized and difficult to reach populations. Tara Bear, hello. Hello, hello. Tara Bear, Shara. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So excited. 
we're so glad to to have you on and we're we're just super thankful that a you are a part of our lives to begin with um and b that you are here to share with our audiences a little bit about uh fertility so we are talking about fertility today and a couple different aspects of it yes and you know fertility can mean a lot of different things right so Fertility can be uh, in the sense that you are making a choice to not have kids. It can mean that you do not have the ability to have kids. It can mean that you're trying to have kids or maybe you have kids and you want more. Um, you know, it, it really is diversified in many different aspects. And between the three of us, we have, you know, different aspects of that, right? And so we are, you know, in the business of having compassionate conversations and providing safe spaces for us to talk about things that may be otherwise uncomfortable or do not get a lot of uh, light shown on them as far as uh, topics. So today we want to have a safe space uh, for our women and for those that love women uh, to be able to continue to love and support and, and come from a place of understanding and acceptance because acceptance or love and love are interchangeable terms. And we really want to be able to support each other as a community, uh, through our, our different choices and, uh, life experiences. Absolutely. So, um, Tara questions for you. I. Uh, what would you say was like your current or previous or planned future self uh, situation with where you're at in life and kids and fertility? Um, well, I think initially I'll say before I married Jonathan, uh, there wasn't really much thought put into children and that being a part of that future. Um, I'd been primarily defining myself by um, my career, some of the volunteer work that I was doing and felt this calling for my purpose being in the service of others in a different way. Um, and so it was a little bit of a surprise for both Jonathan and I, when, you know, we took probably over a year to talk about whether or not we really envisioned ourselves as being parents. And if we were really ready for that type of lifestyle change. And, well, cause I guess I'll say Jonathan also felt pretty similarly to me and wasn't necessarily, you know, hooked to this idea of being a dad as a part of his future either. Um, so it's been a really, it's been a bonding journey for both him and I. Yeah. Making that decision and deciding that a part of how we see our life is hopefully with children. Um, however, given some of the difficulties that we're having, we're also sort of on a side journey within that journey about if that can't happen, how do we, again, then redefine what that future looks like for us? Right. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, and I feel like Carrie and I were always kind of a bit in a similar place as far as like our outlook on having kids. Um, Carrie, do and you want to... Yeah, Tara. Yours? Yeah, Tara. You and I actually talked about this when we first met. Was that like four years ago? Um, inadvertently via Tinder, may I add? <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll leave it up to a mystery what we mean. Yeah, yeah. We'll <laughs> let you guys what? figure that one out. <laughs> um, so yeah, you and I had all, all three of us have actually had conversations where we weren't. 100% sold on the produced ideals of the current uh, world outlook on, you know, having children, right? We, we've been taught, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we've been taught from this aspect of, well, if you're not having a family, if you're not, you know, trying to have kids, then you're not really living your fullest potential. You're not really successful. You know, you're not giving back to society in this way of reproduction. And 
you know, I, I actually at a younger age, you know, in my early twenties, I, I grew up as an only child. And so I actually wanted six kids when I was in my early twenties and I got married at a young age and it, I was going to get pregnant by this time and have my second by this time. And then I realized that I was in a really unhealthy relationship and I did not want to reproduce with this person. I did not want to have to be tied to that person, you know, longer than, you know, my desire. And after, after divorce, ultimately I started finding out more about myself and finding more comfort in myself and happiness within myself. And started to realize that, you know, this, this ideal of children may not necessarily be, you know, what I want my life to be uh, based around. And you mentioned something, Tara, about really wanting to be in the service of others. And that has been a huge driving factor for me as well. I started viewing the community that I was caring for as my family as a child in a sense, you know, I don't want to say I'm being paternalistic to um, humans when I care for them, but I'm feel more energy is available to be able to care for those people uh, when I'm not having to give energy towards raising another human. And so ultimately you know, my husband, when I met him, he was very much, I don't want children. And so I was just kind of like, okay, you know, that, that, that seems to be aligning right now. And so for my husband, John and I, we have decided that we are not going to have children and focus on our enjoyment of this life and our growth and our professional development, um, and whatever kind of spiritual development that we want to focus on. And, and, I know that a lot of my family members have struggled with that and, you know, even friends and coworkers, Oh, you know, you're married now. Next step is babies. And it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Huh. You know, you no. choose, you choose to, <laughs> to continue that conversation or not. You're just like, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cause if you, you know, if you say, Oh no, we're not having kids <sighs> that, you know, brings up a whole struggle as far as, you know, somebody wants to convince you, oh, but you would be great at having, you know, being a parent and sure. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I would. I I really don't have any doubts around that, but it's just not my choice. Yeah. I mean, talk about a topic that literally brings someone's belief system to the look on their face, right? Oh yeah. When you say that you're not having children, um, or that's the decision that you've made. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. It's it's hard to accept that from other, like other people struggle with accepting that. And as I stated earlier, acceptance can be used interchangeably for love too. Mm -hmm. And so this is about loving each other, accepting each other's choices, even if we don't agree with them and loving each other through those choices. Yeah. And definitely bringing yourself to a zero point frequency and step back and see that maybe this is their plan all along, right? Like maybe step back out of the physical aspect of yourself and understand that this is possibly what their map was, what their design was to come here and have those types of experiences. Um, Because we could have gone through many lifetimes ago and we've had tons of children, who knows? So yeah. Uh, for myself, I think of, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Shai. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say that I, I feel like another topic from your show is also vulnerability because I think mm-hmm. that people don't realize that when you don't have that, when you look at others from that particular optic of, of course you want children and of course you're able mm. and ask a question like that, they don't necessarily realize the vulnerable position that that can create mm-hmm. and the level of, um, us deciding ahead of time, how much are we willing to share, talk about it. And like you said, Carrie, for some people deciding, I'm just, I'm not stepping into that space with that particular person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So my particular, I would say decision when at a pretty young age, honestly, I I had decided I didn't want children. 
I think it mostly started off from a fear base. Uh, I didn't want my hips to get bigger because they would tell you that your hips get bigger. And I was like, oh no, that's not happening, you know? And, and then, you know, it would go into a, uh, this is just, this is just not my plan. It's not for me. I, I love kids when I can give them back. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm probably a very super kid person, but I, I do think they're the cutest things ever. Um, again, when, when I can hand them back. So for me, I'd always known that I, I have no plans on having children. Um, things took a little bit of a turn when I got married and he has kids. And so for him, he's older than me. He's about 14 years older than me. So like he, his kids were already like, one was an adult already about to get married, you know, back when him and I were uh, settling into our relationship and deciding to get married and stuff. And then his other one, um, you know, was in, you know, his, uh, going into being a teenager and becoming a teenager. So I stepped directly into a, a motherhood role uh, shortly after getting married, but I still at that point had already told myself that I don't want children for myself, right? I don't personally want to have any kids. And then of course, fast forward through time, you know, within the last year, I ended up getting cervical cancer uh, and I had to get a hysterectomy. So my decision, whether I spent several years in a relationship and then later maybe decided or changed my mind, well, that decision was then taken away at that point. So there's like a lot of emotional transitioning happening there because even though I had already told myself that I didn't want to have kids and I had already, you know, made that decision with my spouse, you know, he, he's older, he doesn't, you know, he's already raised to like all that fun stuff. It was still traumatic to me to go through an experience where I no longer had a decision in that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I completely understand that because even though I've made the decision not to have children, I still like having the option. Right. Like I, the idea of my choice being taken away is not preferred for sure. Right. And I do think you make a valid point that this doesn't mean that we don't love children. No. I, I, I adore kids. Like that was my first job, you know, started babysitting at you know, 10 and then worked at stepping stone daycare and the babies for several years. Like I loved that. Oh yeah. But I like giving them back as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think one place I overlap with Shira on, but for a different reason is having difficulty with getting pregnant despite um, Jonathan and I doing things like an intrauterine insemination um, or using some of the um, fertility drugs and feeling that like this, this endeavor feels different than seeking my PhD in that it doesn't really necessarily matter how hard I work at it mm -hmm. or if I do everything the exact right way, I'm still not guaranteed control over that outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like for any of us that losing that perception of control or something that you really want is a hard thing to, to come to terms with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is in your field, Tara, like, I mean, I'm sure you've probably heard, you know, several stories. Um, and even for like your personal, uh, journey with this, like, what are some of like the emotional, like traumas or things like that, that you've seen? Um, infertility type of psychology isn't really my specialty, but I can say from just like some reading that I've done with the literature as I've been on the journey is that it's really common for both, both partners, um, whether you're talking about like same sex partnership or opposite sex partnership to experience a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, there's actually some uh, specific cognitive behavioral treatments that have been developed to help couples on this journey because, um, you know, it is a hard one. I mean, both in terms of what you're going through as a person, um, but then there's also another piece, one that I personally experienced is related to the effect of some of the um, fertility drugs 
that they, mm. that they give you. For me, I am particularly sensitive to estrogen and always have been. And it's, it takes a different skill level to manage the anxiety that this process of trying to have a baby creates, but then on top of it, this other amplification of it just based on hormones. Um, oh. so both anxiety and depression, um, it's also kind of, um, looked at as, um, it's labeled as invisible loss. Mm. So every time that you're attempting to get pregnant and then you end up menstruating, instead of getting your positive pregnancy test, there's this mm. sense of loss that occurs. Um, so there's also some pieces of psychology that are looking at people kind of how to help them manage that invisible loss. Mm. Wow. I've never heard of that before, but that made so much sense. Yeah. yeah. That's, in, that's incredible. I, I, I'm thinking back to all the times where, you know, especially uh, before, you know, my, my surgery, I, there would be months and occasionally, you know, I'd be like, uh, I'm like a few days late or as, you know, my cycles were never on time. Like, they were always several days off from where they're supposed to be. So it was just like a constant scare, like every month. Right. Um, and you know, and so it was kind of, a you, you would get it and then you'd be like, you'd have like a little switch in your head that just says, huh. And then you're like, oh, thank God. You know, mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and so I can see how that would be even that much more yeah. amplified if you're actually trying um, so wow, that just blew my mind. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because like, I, I know that when I was in the transition period of deciding, I did feel a sense of loss as well. You know, that because I did originate with this idea of having a full house of children. And so uh, that, that term is, yeah, I, I hadn't heard that either the invisible loss, but that makes a lot of sense. And I can't, you know, it's hard for me to put myself in the, in the shoes of actually putting forth the effort and, you know, feeling like it was unsuccessful. So can you share um, some of your experience with the, the coping with um, tools that you've used between you and Jonathan, uh, how you support each other. And also I would love to hear how you want to be supported. Mm-hmm. We, where do I wanna start? So I, I think one of the strengths that I have with my relationship with Jonathan is that um, partially there is this foundation set by being a military couple. Hmm. We've done a lot of hard things together from moving me up from Texas to Alaska, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Alaska to here uh, in, well, Illinois, Missouri, and doing these things on our own. Uh, Living together, we had just moved here uh, around the time of COVID, So living together through COVID and without having had much of an opportunity to develop a community or um, social support system here prior to it hitting. And luckily, we were two people that these experiences have solidified more so our bond, Mm -hmm. made us sillier together uh, (laughs) and much more comfortable with one another to talk about vulnerabilities or um, different aspects that are like both easy and hard about life and so um I think one of one of our strengths that we have used is is being completely honest with each other and how we're reacting to this journey Mm. um we do um a couple of things um that kind of like come to the forefront is when like inevitably when we're getting the negative pregnancy tests is we kind of do this balance of both a little bit of avoidance when it's the early on pregnancy tests in order to maintain our hope. And then as we're getting towards the end of the cycle, these last few tests and getting those negative tests, then it's talking a bit more about our experience and a bit of that sadness and also trying to lift each other up and create Mm. more of that hope. 
we do a couple of extra things also with our schedule. Like uh, I have, both of you know very well, I'm not much of a morning person. <laughs> uh, but one thing that we have added to our routine is me getting up early with Jonathan, who is an early bird, and taking our coffee and going for a walk together. Oh, nice. Talking about the day, talking about, you know, whatever it is that we want to, but just being able to have that time in the morning to, you know, like set the calibration for the day. Mm. Um, so I think we focus a lot on how do we increase our communication and our bond as we do something really, really hard. Yeah. I, I, I think the, the point of vulnerability, you know, coming together as individuals and coming together, you know, to support each other through that vulnerability, because, you know, we, to heal, to support each other, we have to be able to talk about it with each other. And, you know, I'm just going to Brene Brown, you, you know, (laughs) there's a lot of strength in vulnerability. And Mm -hmm. while it feels scary, there's so much building up within that momentum of, you know, utilizing each other through those experiences to, to just talk and get it out because the more we stuff it down, right. The more we resist, the more it will persist. So I I, I just love how you two being able to talk to each other and express your, um, emotions and, you know, disappointments and being able to feel that with each other just strengthens that bond, uh, between the two of you. And I think that's really beautiful. It sets a nice foundation too. Like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, um, I feel very strongly about being honest with people about doing infertility treatment because I think so often things like miscarriage and infertility are things that women feel like they need to keep only to themselves or the struggles with it can't share with anybody else or it means that there's something wrong with me or um, you know, variety of things that, that we think as we go through this process. And I think Jonathan and I having this nice foundation means that when, for example, when I share with my coworkers or my supervisor that the reason why I'm asking for all this time off during the week, you know, two hours here, two hours there is because I'm going through infertility treatment and it's important that I get in for the blood work that they need me to do or um, that I'm there for the exams or the procedures. Mm -hmm. And also to know that, you know, some days if I'm looking a little bit cranky or upset that this isn't personal with work that this is me trying to to process and manage both working a difficult job and doing a difficult thing like infertility treatment Mm -hmm. yeah that's super important that's really really important and and especially that that balancing aspect and the the openness to communicate what you're going through with your partner um you know i going through what i went through also during the time of COVID, you know, there were so many fears that would come up, right? I mean, you know, getting the phone call from your doctor to tell you that you've been diagnosed with cancer is probably one of the scariest phone calls you could ever expect. And then on top of going through that and not knowing if your procedure is going to catch it all, you're also dealing with the mental aspect that you're losing your choice to and body conceive parts. and, and body parts. And, and you're just like, okay, you're, you're, you know, so not only you've got some pandemic situations happening, so you're already terrified to be going into a hospital during that time. Right. Um, you know, you're trying to balance the emotions of, am I broken? Right. Mm. Uh, what's wrong with me? Uh, is this going to kill me? <laughs> uh, you know, wait, what you're taking my decision away from me now. Um, like, like that's so many things to bear and, and just a a single phone call. Right. Um, so I can, I can understand, um, and, and relate in many different ways. I, and it's so interesting that you would go through that kind of mentality when you had already set in your head that I'm not going to have any children. So, you know, you know, somebody else might 
think that, oh, she, well, it shouldn't be any big deal. She didn't want kids anyway. And that's not the case, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you realize that when you're personally going through it, but learning how to express all of that. Um, there were so many times where I'm like, I, I can't, I don't want to talk about this with anybody else. I just, I'm alone in this. This is just me. I'm the only person going through this. No one's going to understand this, right? Um, sometimes you would even feel like you want to like lash out at your partner um, because no matter how supportive they are, you, you don't, they're not going through it. They don't know, right? So it's so important to me uh, to have found the different resources and the different information that was available out there. But at the same time, and we have got to talk about this one, ladies, the sporadicness of where to get the information and how it wasn't just bundled Mm -hmm. up in a pretty package and all in one place for you to just sort through. Um, I mean, I must have done like hundreds of YouTube videos and Google searches and, you know, uh, what, what do I need? How do I get prepared for this? Who do I talk to? Is there anybody else dealing with this? Had this shit happen in the first place? Like, what can I do to tell people? And then you start, you start getting this like strong sense of notion of, I got to tell somebody, you know, Mm -hmm. can this be avoided? Can I protect other women from going through this? Like, it's a, it's a, an emotional roller coaster. Um, but yeah, the, the information section of this though, like for, for you, Tara, you know, where would you say that you went, you know, or did you even experience something like that yourself when just trying to find resources uh, for not only the physical, but the emotional? Yeah, absolutely. It's been, and still is confusing. You have, um, I feel like you have a, like within the scientific community, we would say we have a lot of correlational data and not necessarily a lot of causal data that tells you like, we know we need the sperm and the egg. And it kind of feels like (laughs) after that, you know, uh, like what else is going to make this increase my chances? And and even something like doing um, an intrauterine insemination, the chances of success change based on your age and your difficulty, your particular situation. And so you might be looking at only a 10% chance, no matter what else you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, But yes, like, so um, I would look online, but experience the same thing as you, Shira, where it was like, how do I know who's reputable? Like, you know, even sifting through, like I was saying, some of this like correlational kind of data was like, you know, don't run. But then you know plenty of women who are runners and get pregnant, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, right. Don't eat soy, but you know plenty of vegetarians that get (laughs) pregnant, right? (laughs) Um, And so it became this like, okay, fine, I'll give up soy. Okay, fine, I won't run. Okay, it sounds like biking is okay. Really? Yeah, biking is okay, but running is bad. Sitting on that tiny little seat, your vajay on that tiny little seat is okay. (laughs) Yes, my vajay is okay, but Jonathan shouldn't bike because it's bad for the testicles. (laughs) So it was like, okay, fine, Jonathan won't bike and I'll bike. (laughs) So he can run while you bike. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So it was, yeah. So I I think I got... (laughs) That was one source of information. Then my mother-in-law... Um, is actually highly involved in, in that community. Um, and then I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the particular surgeon. And I love your mother-in-law, by the way. She's Me too. phenomenal. She <laughs> is phenomenal. Shout I out. love her. And she has been <laughs> so helpful with information, but also just like, um, really nice emotional support mm-hmm. through this time. Um, the other people, um, that I would go to were some of my other friends who, um, had maybe had difficult births or I come to you, um, you all for emotional support and knowing me as a person to help me get through this journey. I'd been introduced through friends to other women who had gone through infertility treatments. Um, one of them in particular who ended up getting pregnant and had been super like on top of getting her info. And so she would pass down information to me about what she did or what she found or some like cool sources for um, like tracking different things or, or information that I needed or 
explaining, you know, a rationale for a particular recommendation that I was getting. And so I think it, it became about like getting branched out into knowing what were reputable, reputable sources, but also different within your community, people in the community or social support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And see, again, we, we need more community in this. We need more like outward support because what about those people that don't have those social support systems that are well connected and know other people that are dealing with some similar issues? How, like, we don't want to leave other people unsupported. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to circle back around to something uh, about, you know, Tara, you've done a great job uh, really focusing on, you know, the hope and being vulnerable uh, with your husband, with Jonathan and supporting each other. But Shira, you said something that I really wanted to, you know, make sure we touch on is that sense of brokenness, that feeling guilt, that looking at ourselves and saying, what am I doing wrong? You know, something must be wrong with me. Oh, yeah. How do we, how do we address those types of, you know, internal battles? I think honestly, like just from my own personal experience, so, you know, and I, I try to do my best not to talk for anyone else outside of my own personal experience though. So, um, but I'm, I'm sure there's, there's plenty out there that can relate uh, just based even off the conversations I ended up having with um, friends during the time, right. Or during that time. Um, there was a lot of blame towards myself, right? Like I put a lot of blame on myself during all that, you know, I didn't do the right follow-ups to the OBGYN or, you know, um, how did I not know that this was going on in my body this whole time? I didn't understand that there was areas of my body where I was uncomfortable, but I was so used to it. I didn't know it was not normal. Um, you know, there were so many things that I, I felt to myself that maybe I could have stopped this before it got to this point. Uh, did I cause myself to have that kind of situation to happen? Um, I do feel a little fortunate that I happened to be going through my spirituality journey while all this was going on. So I was learning during all of that to take a step back from my emotional situation and look at it in a, a bit of a different light and a bit of a different uh, state from the blaming of myself and being a bit more compassionate to myself that this is happening as sad as it is, as hard as it is, it's happening at a time that it was meant for me. Um, you know, and I, and I think of all of these like random synchronistic moments that took place that led me to finding out when I did, um, you know, like, uh, and I, I've shared this story before on my social media, but, you know, learning, uh, I went and did a, we went on like a crazy date day for my anniversary. Um, and we had a lot of different types of foods that weekend and, that led me to being in an immense amount of pain to the point where, um, you know, the next morning I was trying to make a decision on whether or not I was going to have to go to the hospital. Um, but I was so afraid to be in a hospital during the peak time frame of all the COVID patients being there that I was literally trying to like talk myself out of it. Um, and my husband was like, this is abnormal. You need to go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nurse Carrie told you too. Yeah. Nurse Carrie was like, girl, you crying. Like, this isn't that good. Yeah. Can you tolerate this pain? Right. No. Well, then you need to go. Yeah. I love you. But yeah. It's super true. Yeah. That's right. I was, you know, vulnerable moment here, but I was totally sitting on a toilet trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to do while talking to Carrie. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, yeah. And so I did end up going and they did, you know, an MRI and a CAT scan and, and that's when they found everything, you know? And so honestly, I'll, I'll be honest, when they kept coming into the room, it was like bad news bears. They just kept giving me more bad shit every time they walk in the room and tell me my results. So, but I kept thinking about like, 
you know, the turn of events that took place, right? Like I walked myself through this, but looking at it from a bit more of a neutral perspective and not so much, it's your fault, you're broken, you did this to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Which is really harsh. And and we've got to, you know, as, as a species, we've got to stop blaming ourselves for everything uh, that goes wrong in our lives. Sure, we can make a mistake uh, in a general sense, but it's okay that things happen to you at the time they happen because I do tend to look back at that situation now and I am a bit more grateful for it because I learned so much and it brought me into a community um, which definitely will link some of the resources that I had below. Um, but you know, I met a lot of people from, uh, histersisters.com, um, that I, I mean, what an incredible resource talk about, you know, a really good one-stop shop. Um, and you know, there was a lot of people there that were very supportive and they tell their stories and you share that with them as well. And they help you with that support system that you really need during those times. Um, you know, I'm also very fortunate that I have my friends that I have, um, including you ladies. So, uh, that were there. Um, and I did a lot of energy healing work during all that too. Um, uh, Carrie, you were, you've been on a journey on practicing how to do Reiki. And so I was like, I will be your test subject. Mm-hmm. Get this shit <laughs> out of my body. Right. Like, <laughs> so, um, so she actually did a, uh, a Reiki session with me. I felt a pop when she did it too. It was super cool. Like I, it was like a, a pop of energy, like right on the top of my stomach. I was like, what the shit was that? You know? And, <laughs> and just to clarify, I don't touch anybody. No, like it's, no. you're just working in the aura. Yeah. So you're like a good six inches to a foot off of the person. So, <laughs> so that was actually pretty cool. Um, but I, one of my most relieving, um, which is so weird because I was so terrified to do it, but it was talking about it and sharing my experience. Um, I, it took me, uh, probably a few days. I had like typed up notes, um, on what I wanted to share, how I wanted to tell my friends and family. Cause I honestly, I didn't know what the outcome was going to be. I didn't know if the cancer had spread to the colon or anything else. Right. Um, So, but I didn't want anyone to have that same overwhelming feeling of being alone, even though I knew I wasn't, it was, it was a very, uh, interesting situation because you feel so alone, even when you have so many resources out there and you have so many people around you to support you. Um, so I, I think about that, right. I think about like, well, why did I do that? Like I wasn't alone. I was never alone. And it's something I tell, you know, our audience all the time and people that I talk to you, like, you know, whether you see them or not, you're literally never alone. <laughs> so, and you need it. You need it the same, you know, same yeah. for uh, my end of things is um, feeling that being able to be honest about what's really going on, being able to be vulnerable, being able to talk honestly, allow other people to support you. It makes the difference for getting through this. And I think is also a major contributor to resolving self-blame kind of thoughts, because if you hold it all in and you never talk to anybody, that cycle just spins for you. And, you know, one of the things I was thinking about when you talked about like your thoughts of self-blame is that it often kind of feels like this way that we can then have control in the future. Like Mm -hmm. if this was all my fault, then it means Mm -hmm. that I can prevent further tragedy from happening to me. If I can just figure out the things that I did that did this. But on your journey, you talk a lot about like the flip side of that, which is like acceptance and living in a chaotic world and in in a chaotic body that you don't, you don't have control over whether or not you develop cancerous cells necessarily. Like there's people that have never smoked a day in their life and still develop lung cancer. Yep. Um, and the other side of that acceptance is that connection, mm. connection to your community, connection to your, to your friends, to, to the community that has been through it. Like you said, your sister's group, and then your, your community, um, 
like for example you sharing on Facebook all the things that you did was it was well written it was inspirational and also gave me the opportunity to feel braver myself in sharing what my journey has been with infertility but also in being able to give you support and offer you love mm. and if Thank you wouldn't you. have shared it I would otherwise wouldn't have had that opportunity Thank you for saying that. And that was my hope, honestly. Um, my hope was to, uh, because I mean, before all that, most people would have looked at my social media and just been like, well, she has a pretty good time. She's got this perfect image of a life <laughs> maybe, um, you know? And so nobody always knows what's going on behind the curtains and you know, we tend, especially with social media, we tend to just project to others what we want them to see. Um, and so that increases others in their thought process of being alone because they're only visually seeing mm. what others want you to see. And it's not always the truth of what's really going on in their lives. And there is a lot of people that are out there that are going through uh, similar situations. Um, and I can, you know, this was something that opened my eyes because after I did post all that information and I was scared, I mean, I threw my phone on my bed, walked oh. away from it, didn't come back to it for at least 24 hours. Cause I was just terrified. I was like, I've never been that vulnerable on a, on a social media platform ever, or even to half those people that I knew on there. And, and, and the amount of love and support, I mean, I don't think I was expecting anyone to just like all my shit and troll me right because I probably would have deleted them but like uh, you know but I, I definitely um the amount of love and support and the surprise I was honestly surprised on how many people were going through the exact same thing and and them telling me their stories and their journeys and what helped them um, and sharing that with me helped me get through it even more, but the entire messaging was, I don't want you to feel alone. Like, I don't want to feel alone in this. And I also don't want anyone else to feel alone and just know that there is a place that you can go to, even if it's me going through it at that time, I was still willing to hear other people's messages and, and feel that connection. Right. So being vulnerable while it can be scary, it creates a new sense of strength within yourself, within the immediate relationships that you are being vulnerable with. And it shares that sense of strength with others who are also needing that kind of light in their life. It's just a a beautiful reminder of the importance of having these kinds of uncomfortable conversations and being compassionate through it. You know, compassion is one of our greatest powers, right? It is us, us being able to love each other through our differences. And while we may not always understand or may not always be able to relate, having that compassion, listening with uh, love, you know, accepting somebody for who they are, the state that they're in and what they're going through and continuing to love them through all of it. That is, you know, something that is so needed right now. So needed. And I'm thankful for all of you and being able to have access to lots and lots of social supports as I've gone through it, because I will say not everybody in my life has been so supportive or um, so thoughtful about that kind of compassionate response that you're talking about. Like I've had one person say to me that because I had the COVID vaccine, that that is probably why I am unable to have children right now. Wow. No scientific evidence whatsoever just, to make a statement like that, but just a fear-based statement. Totally. And when you think about like, there's lots of people that also struggle with self-blame within infertility. Like, um, luckily that hasn't been so much of an issue for me. Like I understand that I'm 39 years old. There's some things that are just like more difficult, um, as you get older. Um, but 
I also think that because I have such a compassionate social support community that I was sort of more protected against some of that self-blame. And so even when I've had some unfortunate interactions like that with people, I kind of feel like I have a greater buffer because of my friends like you. Do you have any uh, final advice um, for people that are going through infertility that are, you know, feeling down that are, you know, searching for light? Be honest with yourself, be honest with the people in your community, your social support community that you can take that chance to be vulnerable, to get that alternative information that it's not your fault. Be willing to confront and be vulnerable with those hard feelings that come along with that sense of loss or that loss of control. And I think the more that you're able to dive deep into that and get the support that you need while you go through it, whether you know maybe some people will need therapy, some people, their friends will be good. But I think that's, it's a huge component of getting through this journey in a way that helps you to see your purpose, your meaning, where you're going next and not be so like sucked up by the despair. And I don't know if, if it's, I'm, I'm really interested also in Shira's response to that because I feel like Shira's journey has been one of that loss of control too. And I also hear what's, in part different from mine is that I didn't have to confront mortality in that moment at the same time. Mm. Yeah. Um, for the most part, what helped me was, first of all, I have control issues. Something I, <laughs> <laughs> like, first of all, <laughs> first of, like, let's just, let's just be honest here. I have always had control issues. I want control over everything, even the amount of dishes in the sink. Right. So, <laughs> and how they're put in the dishwasher. And how they're put in the dishwasher. <laughs> she knows we were roommates. She knows. So yeah. Um, that was, uh, that was tough, but what helped me get through it was something my doctor said to me. And that was, I uh, let go of how you are wanting other people to feel. Um, mm. because there was a lot of times where I just wanted to cry and that's it. I just want to sit in my own little bubble of sadness and just let it out. But I was so worried about how is this, how is my situation going to impact others if I do that, you know? Um, and so bringing some compassion back into myself and focusing back on what do I need? And right now I just need to sit here and freaking cry. Um, but communicating that to my family and my friends you know, there would be times that I'd call Carrie and be like, Carrie, I just need to vent, you know, and I know that this is hard on you because I'm your best friend and you're watching me go through this, but I just need your ear to just let me vent. Right. Mm, um, and I remember, be pissed I remember off. you calling and asking if it was okay. Right. Right. Um, or, and there were times that I would tell my husband, look, I just want to be sad. I want to sit here in this dark living room with the TV light on and just be sad and, and, and feel this, mo this emotion, um, and, and let it work through me because I don't want to hold it in to give everybody else room. I need that room. Right. So that was something that, again, I felt fortunate enough for a, the doctor to say that statement to me because it hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, and, and B I was going I was in the beginning phases of my awakening and my spiritual journey to realize that self-care is one of the biggest factors of your entire experience. Um, and, and everything that happens following that is always based on what you're doing for yourself. So that, that right there was probably the biggest thing. And then, I, and then, you know, last, but definitely not least being vulnerable and sharing my story. Um, that helped a lot because then I realized how I was really, really, really not alone in that. 
um, even people that I thought were very distant from me reached out and shared their story with me. And I felt a sense of community during that. Um, so, yeah. So yeah. We, we've talked a lot about, you know, what those individuals can do that are going through, you know, these experiences themselves. We've got, you know, our people out there that are trying to support um, the people that they love that are, you know, struggling with these things. So from a, you know, social support standpoint, a caregiver standpoint, how can we support you? What is, what is a way that the community that, you know, can best support individuals that are going through this experience? So for myself, I would probably say, um, whether it was frustrating or not to do the amount of research that I had to do, um, because it is again, not wrapped up in a little pretty package. Um, some of the community things that could be useful are places to go have these types of conversations like that history sisters dot, you know, calm site that I was telling you about, um, and, uh, reaching out to your friends and family members, uh, if you have that support or if you have those types of connections. Um, and again, if you don't, there are so many resources available out there to you to build those. So we'll definitely make sure that we said we add those links below for you guys to, to take a look at that. Um, and Tara, if you want to share yours. Um, it's sort of hard to like summarize it all. Um, I feel like to be a good social support, the things that have been really meaningful to me have been having conversations where my my friends make me feel hopeful about the journey that I'm on um, that give me, give me space and room when I'm not feeling my best or when I say, you know what, I really want to be there for you today, but I am, I am not feeling good. I just was having, you know, for the entire 30 minute drive home, having a panic attack because of this fertility drug. And I, I want to be there for you, but I don't have a lot of space to be able to give at this moment. Um, so that ability for some of my friends to understand when I'm having a hard time and allowing that space for it and compassion still for me as a person and not taking it personally. Um, I think the other is reaching out to friends that you know that have struggled in maybe a similar way and being willing to connect to people who might not have otherwise have had contact um, a friend of mine had done that where, um, because I'm not, where like, Shyler, Shyler, you were talking about finding it helpful to like go to these online communities. And for me, it felt more like rumination and was like upsetting me more to read some mm -hmm. of the blogs and to join some of those like online formats. Sure. Um, but I had a friend who connected me with a, a friend of hers that I've never met and would never have the opportunity to meet you know, and she sort of reached out to her outside of me and said, hey, like, I have another friend who's going through something similar. Can I introduce you? And asked me the same thing. Would you be okay if I told her about what you're going through? Can I introduce you? Like, she's an amazing guru of infertility information and has gotten pregnant. And she connected us. And this woman had been so helpful awesome. along this journey. Um, Jonathan and I are taking a bit of a break right now. So that's why I'm sort of talking about it in the past tense. He'll deploy soon. And so we're putting a pause on things until a little bit later so that we have a greater chance of him being present for the birth. But um, so I need to reach back out to her. That's why I'm reminding myself of that right now. Uh, <laughs> but she has been, <laughs> she has been so helpful. And so I think um, that piece was really cool. That willingness to kind of connect people that, that otherwise maybe wouldn't have had contact. So one piece of advice that I have for, you know, friends or family, you know, that are going through or may have somebody that they love that is, is dealing with fertility issues or, um, you know, is, is struggling with pregnancy, struggling with, um, you know, the loss of choice. And that's to just listen, you know, hold space for that loved one 
to be whatever they are in that moment, whether it's happy, whether it's sad, whether it's grieving, whether it's playful, hold space for that person. Do the portion of communication that we struggle so hard with. Shut your mouth and listen. (laughs) And I highly, highly recommend if you are in the physical space with that person, just to open your arms to them. Sometimes all that they need is a hug, a hand on their hand, nodding in awareness and acceptance and just reminding that person that you love them, which is doing so through the, through the physical, you know, uh, uh, offering of holding space for that person. Oh, babe, you are so good at that too. I just want to bring up like part of my infertility journey meant that I couldn't go to Jamaica for your wedding. And I, before I could even get the words out to tell you that the doctors were telling me I couldn't travel and I'm crying. You listened, you provided me so much compassion and so much love. And even though like your wedding had been postponed a year because of the vid already (laughs) yeah other people were like we can't travel there now like for whatever reason and like you are especially adept at that listening and giving of love even even when it meant something personally painful for you and I just love and appreciate you for that absolutely oh my gosh I mean who am I to tell you you have to you know for conform to what I want it's your life too you know, we, we are each here having our own personal experience with, you know, our, our needs for personal growth. Who am I to limit you in that? I love yeah. you guys so much. Love you guys love so, you. so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, listeners, we really appreciate you guys uh, taking time to be with us in this moment and being a part of this compassionate conversation and just remembering to love first, love last, and love always. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank, thank you, thank you Tara. so much, Tara. Thank you for having me, both of you. Love you. Absolutely. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a great day. Lovely, infinite beings, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us in this moment and being open to receiving light and love. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and we really look forward to our next connection. And as a reminder, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to stay notified of new content from Love Always Self. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Love Always Self, which will be linked in the show notes. We would love to hear from y'all. So if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to discuss, please email us at contact at lovealwaysself.com or send us a private message on our social media. I'm Karista. And I'm Shira. And until next time, love love always always self. self. Love Always Self podcast is meant for entertainment purposes only. We do not make any warranties about the completeness, reliability, and accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. Any action you take upon the information on this podcast is strictly done so at your own risk, and we will not be held liable for any losses and damages in connection with the use of our podcast. Any and all medical concerns should be addressed with a licensed healthcare provider, as well as any questions that may be derived from information discussed in this podcast.